thank you for putting up with all of that. That was uh, that was fairly uh, unprofessional, but there you go. That's the kind of guy I am. Um, as you can see, I like very uh, you know small titles, but actually what I like is footnotes. See, it looks funnier in the footnotes because there's lots and lots of little things make up a big problem we're finding. Um, what I'm here to talk to you about is, is the hyperscale at the edge. My name is Peter Lees. I'm the head of solutions and innovation for SUSE in Asia Pacific. Um, so I look after our pre-sales team. Uh, we have people in India, Japan, uh, Korea, Singapore, Australia, and so on. And what I'd like to talk to you about is, is the edge. What is the edge? But before I go into that, I'd like to show you a nice picture. Everything's working really well today. There we go. Um, this lovely picture, this is, uh, this is Nuremberg in Germany. This is where Sousa is from. So it's our 30th birthday week this week. We've been around for 30 years. So can I have a hooray? Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, if you ever get a chance to travel uh, to Europe again, uh, it's starting to open up now. If you ever get a chance to go to Germany, please go and stop in Nuremberg. It's a beautiful medieval city with a castle, cobbled streets, everything. And it happens to be our headquarters as well. Um, so I've been there a few times, and I can tell you that it's, it's great. You, I, I, I stay in the hotel next to the station, and I catch the subway through to the uh, just outside of the walls of the, of the city where the, um, where the office is, and then I walk back. Uh, through the cobbled streets, past the cathedral, the, the, the Christmas market, if it's there, and all that kind of stuff. I do it that way because it's downhill on the way back home. So Ali Brush is very, very popular with manage all the things, do all the things, clean up all the things. If you've not read Hyperbole and a Half, it's a, it's a fantastic uh, uh, website and, and comic. But this is what you try to do when you're doing, uh, when you're doing Edge. You're look, we're talking about lots and lots and lots of very small devices sitting on the edge of the network, uh, on, the, uh, on the periphery of, of the data center. Um, and so the question is, how do we manage these things? How do we actually want to, to take control of these devices? And it's, it's something that my team has been sort of struggling with. You know, what are these devices? What are these applications that are happening on the edge? It's actually a, a, a term that's become very popular recently, but it's been around for a, for a while. So actually understanding what it is that con constitutes the edge and then how we can make use of that and, and what, what we need to think about when we're considering edge devices is, uh, is something which we're all trying to get our heads around. And the thing is, our first uh, instinct as, you know, as IT people is to control all of these devices, make sure they're all working properly and, and so on. But then the question is, what is the scale that we're talking about here? And, Understanding the scale of, of edge devices is, is a really interesting kind of consideration because this, this picture here is, is redwood trees in California. Who's, who's ever been to these sort of sequoias in California or, or the western US? They are huge. If you've not been there, they are massive. I mean, we do have some big trees in Australia as well. There's some really big ones down in, in Tasmania, but these are, these are enormous. They're not only tall, but they're huge. So the, the concept of scale that you have gets completely changed. You go, oh yeah, that's a tree. And then you get closer to it. No, no, that's a really big tree. And you get closer again, and oh my god, it's a ridiculous tree. Our brains need to be trained to understand how this scale applies. And the same applies when we're talking about edge technology and, and how we cope with that. So to give it an idea, um, I think this is a graph from Forrester showing the, the relative growth between you know, IoT and Edge and, and other devices. So things that are not IoT, you know, they've been growing over time. Um, these are, this is numbers in billions of devices in the world. We can see we're at 2022, we're about 10 billion uh, non-IoT de uh, non devices. And then in a few years' time, we'll have 10.3 <laughs> non-IoT devices. But at the same time, we're seeing exponential growth in IoT and edge devices. These, everything that's a smart thing, a smart, uh, uh, a smart camera, a smart uh, light bulb. You know, Three years ago, when we wanted to get some smart light bulbs to do a demo at, at one of our conferences, they were like you know, $50 each. Now, you know, I went down to Bunnings the other day, and there was like $5 for a, for a smart light bulb. So the accessibility of these things and the ability to, to, uh, to have them you know, exponentially increase in the number 
uh, is, is enormous. So getting your head around this is, can be tricky. Here's another example from one of our customers. They had 15,000 locations, and each of these locations around the world, they had some IoT, industrial IoT devices, sensors and cameras and all sorts of things, various different levels of sophistication. About 500 per device. That means 7.5 million devices to manage. 7.5 million devices to make sure that they're on the right patch level, to make sure that they are secure, to make sure that they are doing the right thing at the right time. This is a complicated task, and it's something where, uh, you know, when you're considering how do we deploy this, how do we orchestrate it, how do we manage it, a lot of the concepts and tools that we've been using in the past just don't apply. So, if we're talking about manage all the things, we sort of quickly get to manage all the things. Do we, do we have to? Is that really what we need to do? So we've been looking at, at what is the edge and how can we address the edge and how can we make things easier for people to, to manage the devices at the edge and deal with this. And we're defining three kinds of edge. This is our definition. It may fit your definition. Um, but there's near edge, far edge, and tiny edge. So near edge is sort of things that, that telcos are interested in. It's usually the network equipment that sits just outside the, the data center, you know, periphery, if you like. Um, you don't have many of these. Maybe tens of them, a few dozen uh, of these sorts of devices in your data center or, or nearby. Distribution points, if you like. The far edge is on site. They're at a remote location. There may be hundreds or thousands of them in your, in your network. Um, they're a long way from the data center, but they're closer to where the people are using them or where they are being used for whatever need um, they have. And then beyond that is the tiny edge, and that's these thousands or hundreds of thousands of tiny little devices, each of which has some sort of logic on it. It may be a sensor. It may be a, a light bulb. Uh, hopefully, it's, it's the sort of thing which is uh, not too easy to, to attack, but it's usually robust, and it's often in a very uh, uh, hazardous environment or, or um, hostile environment. So here's an example of a hostile environment. <laughs> Home Depot. It's not a hostile environment. That's not true. Uh, so Home Depot is, is an example of that, that, uh, that far edge. Now they have something like 2,300 locations around the US. For those of you who don't know, Home Depot is Bunnings, basically. It's the orange Bunnings for, for the US. Um, I don't know if they have sausages. Do they have sausages at Home Depot? No? See, you know, the Americans can't do some things very well. Look, um, maybe they have hamburgers or something. Um, for our American friends, if you haven't been to Bunnings and had a Bunnings sausage, uh, I, I heartily recommend the experience. It's an important part of the Australian cultural landscape these days. Uh, my two-year-old son had his first Bunnings sausage on the weekend. Um, he heartily enjoyed it. Anyway, don't get onions if you're going inside. Anyway, Home Depot has 2,300 stores. And uh, obviously, they are in many you know, remote locations. They're a long way away from where the the data center is. They don't have an IT person uh, available at every store. They have to reduce the complexity of their, their systems administration process to, have you tried turning it off and on? From that point, everything then has to work. Everything has to recover itself. So they've been, they started off with, with uh, perhaps traditional point of, uh, edge device, a point of service terminal, or the point of sale terminals, the cash machines, right? They are all POS devices. They are all remotely updated uh, from a centralized point. But they're increasingly moving into more sophisticated um, uh, technology inside of their stores to track uh, customer locations. Where's the traffic uh, going to be relevant? If we move this lot of wheelbarrows over here, is, are people going to, to go towards the wheelbarrows there, or are they going to go to the, something else over here? You know, all of this sort of stuff. What they've done is they to, to drive all of this automation and information gathering inside of their systems, inside of their stores, uh, they've installed a number of servers. Three servers, because they want to have uh, redundancy. They run Kubernetes on top of that. And they can push their applications remotely out to all of these stores. And every single time they need to put a new box in, all they, all they do is they they send the box uh, for someone to plug into the power, to plug into the network, and from that point on, all of the centralized control takes over. So that's, that's one example. So these point of sales terminals and these retail uh, sensor devices and so on. Here's another example. Wind farms. So wind farm in, in China. Um, each one of these 
windmills is an edge device. So wind farms go where the wind is, often not next to a data center, which is easy to, to get access to. Um, and each of these has to essentially operate independently. It's its own mini data center. When we're pushing out, when we're pushing out uh, new uh, updates and securing environments and so on, securing the systems, we have to make sure that we have the cluster in each windmill can be updated remotely. As you can see, there's quite a few of them, right? But they have to also operate together as a, as a mesh network because if the windmills get out of sync in terms of the ways that they're delivering power and all those sorts of things, um, it can really uh, stuff up the, the electricity system. So there's lots of complexity that has to be done in the, in the monitoring. And we wanted to push the, 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 um, the electricity operator, wanted to push that logic to that local device. And this is another aspect of what edge means. You know, you could have a sensor and then return that information back to a central point and then, and then take some action. But one of the definitions of edge is that you're doing the action locally. You're taking action. You're responding to the sensors that you're having. And that's why, why you need the increased compute power. The great thing is, with the increases in compute power, the reduction in, in power requirements for some processes these days, we can put that level of intelligence and that knowledge inside of these remote systems. It's then just a matter of managing, securing, updating, and so on. Here's another example. Cows. Cows are definitely edge devices. No, this is actually a, a farm, uh, a farm uh, technology company in, in Italy is uh, creating uh, what they call um, precision farming. And this is about, again, measuring the conditions inside of a, a, a dairy barn, making sure that the humidity is right, making sure that the gas levels are right, making sure that the cows aren't emitting too many of the, the gases and all these sorts of things, uh, in order to basically ensure the well-being of, of, the, of the, the, the cows, uh, and also to help manage the environmental impact that the farm is, is, uh, is coming up with. So again, but quite hostile environment. You can imagine a cow barn is actually quite a hostile environment. There's, there's dust, there's moisture, there's things from cows. Uh, but and, uh, these are all devices which have to be uh, put out there in a robust fashion under the management of someone who's used to driving cows, not driving IT. So it all has to be very simple to set up, be able to take action uh, locally, but be able to be remotely updated. This is another great example. This is, uh, this is a logging truck. Not logging in terms of trees, but logging as in recording data. So Schlumberger is one of the biggest uh, mining exploration companies in the world. Um, these, these trucks are worth millions of dollars, and they're worth you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a day to be, to be out in the field to the company. So they don't want to bring them in to get updated. The trucks themselves are full of measuring equipment. Uh, they have a, a, a probe that goes down the, the exploration hole to work out what minerals are under the ground, basically. Inside of the trucks is a, is a data center, essentially. But these are often in very remote sites. So the bandwidth available to, to do updates via satellite or, or, or radio link is, is pretty small, often. So they have to be self-contained. They have to be self-managed. But they also have to be updatable. And being able to update in the field means that they can keep these trucks out longer. So all they need to do is get to a place where they can get a good bandwidth. We can send the updates, the patches, the, the new applications, whatever it needs to be done in order to interpret that data better. My brothers do this sort of stuff. And so uh, I know a bit about it. The, the, the actual probe that they use to send down the hole, um, that's a device that lasts for 10 or 15 years. It's a very you know, standard kind of device. But a lot of the cleverness is about how do you interpret the data that's, that's coming out along the wire and, and record it. And that's where updates to the apps, being able to make a rapid update to the app, perhaps when you're in the field measuring this, this, this data, um, makes, can make a huge difference to the quality of the data that the customer is receiving. Here's another truck. This is a garbage truck in, uh, in San Diego. Uh, they've been using cameras on the arms to make sure that they're not stealing the bins. Uh, I have a, a colleague who, who lives in San Diego, and he says he's, he's got all of these green bins that he can, he can use uh, to put his garden waste in and things like that. But every so often when the truck comes along, it picks up the bin and it steals it. it just the, the, the bin goes into the truck along with all the waste. 
right? And in, in the past, what he'd have to do, he'd go down and go, ugh, a bin's been stolen again. He'd have to go into the, uh, to the, the house again, call up the, the local council and say, look, you've stolen my bin. And they go, OK, well, we'll go find one for, OK, sure. We'll, we'll make a note of that, and we'll send it to you eventually. Right? So there's this long process. It's a very manual intervention. He had to call up the contact center, had to do a lot of waiting and so on. And obviously, enough people were doing this that, that, the, uh, that the, the trash department decided to put cameras on the bins themselves, not only just to record the video, but also to have some AI on the, on the, uh, on the, the truck to say, hey, that's a bin, and I don't have it on my arm anymore, so it's probably gone into the thing. Now, they don't go climbing around to pull it out. What they just do then is automatically order a new bin for, for the guy. <laughs> so the next time the truck comes around, it just drops the bin off. Right? But edge device again, right? It's all the AI, all the processing is happening locally. The camera is identifying that, yes, this is a bin, and I had a bin, and now I don't have a bin. It's probably in my back. Um, so I need, to, I need to then go and make that, that order. Uh, from, from garbage trucks to aeroplanes, this is a, does anyone know what this is? Anyone? No, it's not a drone. Close. Anyone? Bueller? Yes, it's a, it's a specific one. Anyone? This is a U-2 spy plane. That's right. First introduced in the 1950s. The last one was produced in the 1980s, and they are still running. They are still updating them. Um, this is a very much a Cold War aircraft, but again, Lots and lots of electronics, lots and lots of compute power inside of those devices, inside of those machines. As far as the US Air Force is concerned that, that runs these things, this is an edge device because they want to be completely autonomous inside of that, inside of that ma machine. Um, but they also want to be able to apply new updates. Again, as I said, the software is often the most important part rather than the receiving scanner or the camera or whatever they're using. The camera is maybe very high resolution already, but interpreting the data, being able to do that locally and then send some information back, or being able to interpret it locally and then maybe reposition some of the cameras that it's got uh, on board, rather than, because it's flying at, I don't know, I think it's about two or three times the speed of sound as it's, as it's traveling over. So you don't have a long time to send the data back to head office, have someone look at a printout of a photo, say, yeah, can you look at this other thing? It's like, well, no, I'm on the other side of the world now. So I, so being able to do that remotely, you know, maybe they take a few pictures of the wrong things, but you know, it, it, it means that they have a better chance of focusing on, on some of the details that they might want to see once the mission is finished. This is a drone, right? This is, this is a drone. Um, and this is a really interesting use case, uh, not this specific picture, it's just a picture of a drone, but uh, in Hong Kong, where they have very tall buildings but are often hard to get to, uh, there are some companies that are looking at using drones to do building maintenance work. That is identifying where you need to you know, fix a window or patch a wall or, or do something like that. Oh, look, something's dripping. Um, again, the smart technology in here, the edge technology here is that the, the drone could fly around and take a picture of the whole 80-story you know, building. Or it flies around, looks for things, and says, that's a, that's a patch that I don't recognize. That doesn't look like a good piece of concrete, or that doesn't look like the way a window should look. I'll take a more detailed picture of that. And then, then when the operator is reviewing the footage from the drone, they don't have to go through two hours worth of, oh, look, the wall is fine. They can just focus on the pieces where things were wrong, and uh, then they can send the maintenance team to do the right thing. Again. Autonomous action, uh, remote, uh, remote activity, uh, but also you want to be able to update it. Uh, medical equipment is another one, another one of our customers. Um, they wanted to be able to update not only the, the measuring devices that are inside the hospital, but the fact that they have lots of different types of devices. And often in the medical context, the, the devices are, are certified and, you know, guaranteed and have, have uh, certifications against them. So they can't be changed very frequently. If you've got some new technology or some new, uh, new thing you want to do, then you can't necessarily roll out a whole new bunch of hardware just because you want to fix that particular solution. So being able to use older hardware with newer technology is another aspect that we see in, in edge cases. 
a lot of the time for either compliance reasons or reasons of you know, location, like a windmill in the middle of China, you don't have the option of updating the hardware very frequently. So you want to make sure that you can make the most use out of that hardware. Maybe it's even hardware that already, already exists. And that's where lightweight footprints, lightweight operating systems become really, really important. And finally, this is, this is slowed down. This is a bottling plant. Uh, so Crohn's is a, is a uh, they make bottling machinery uh, for people like you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi and, and, uh, and others. They do, at, at maximum speed, they do something like 40,000 bottles an hour. Um, so obviously, shutting things down to stop to do a, a software update is not something they want to do. Right? They want to run these plants 24-7 uh, very, very fast. So they've been implementing, uh, again, Kubernetes, uh, so they can, they can do containerized monitoring of their, of their systems. Their IoT has turned into, sorry, their, their industrial technology has turned into a containerized approach. So that they can do, you know, blue-green testing and make sure that okay, this is working, that's working. I can flip backwards if I if I have a, a problem. So if I, I do hit a snag, if I update the software or do a patch, I can roll back really, really quickly. So industrial devices like this one are another huge area of expansion in in this edge technology space. So what I'm getting at here is these are all things that you could be working on. Right? These are all. Kubernetes uh, environments, these are all containerized cloud native, even though they're not necessarily connected to the cloud, but they're cloud native technologies. Here's one of my favorites. This is a potato in space. So we've been working with a company called Hypergiant, and, and uh, not this one isn't a potato, but this is the picture they, they use. They call it a potato in space because the power requirements and the, the power capability is about the same as you can get from a potato. Um, little camera, a little, uh, little uh, gyroscope, all of these sorts of things. The idea is to get the satellite as small as possible, we're talking uh, this sort of size, in order to, um, to make it cheaper to launch. Now, the thing, about, uh, the thing about space and satellites is it's really hard to send a technician up if they need to do some adjustments, right? So everything has to be done remotely, again, even within that small size, they're able to get a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster in there, and be able to update the apps accordingly um, in the window that they have whilst the, when it goes over uh, like a maintenance window um, uh, for their satellite with the right level of bandwidth, okay? And then, and then finally, uh, an example uh, from Europe, a, a telco company. So the ultimate example, or a very clear example of this, not having a an admin available. Right? So, this German uh, telco company wanted to redo their broadband networking system, um, redo their gateways for their broadband network. So they had very clear that 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 near edge, far edge, and tiny edge. The near edge is in their data center. The far edge is basically those things you see by the side of the road, the poles you see by the side of the road, which, where, where they then distribute out uh, to their customers for their broadband connection. Each of those far edge uh, locations, and there's a couple of thousand of them, I think, has a little tiny data center inside. The way that the, uh, the, the tech would go out and, and set up one of these is essentially drive out there, find the box, take their little computer out of the box, plug it into the, the color-coded power, the color-coded network, and the color-coded management network, and turn it on. That's all that person does. They then go away for an hour, come back, and that system has been completely set up and is ready to act as a gateway for the broadband network for that, for that region. So that's the level of complexity that we want to be able to achieve and manage uh, when we're talking about Fire Edge devices. So the common themes that we've seen in all of these examples is that you usually don't have IT expertise available at the location, whether that's you know, because you've got cows or because you're in space. Um, you know, there's lots of reasons for not having expertise available. So it needs to be as simple as possible, but you want to also take advantage of that complexity. We're using a small footprint. We've often got very tight power and space budgets to work with. But we have technology now, very lightweight uh, technology, both at operating system level, Kubernetes level, to be able to cope with that. 
typically non-stop operation, typically hostile environments like no air or cows. Um, and all of this drives the, the need for having as much automation as possible. So in the DevOps context or the DevSecOps context, we're, we're talking about, we're talking about uh, GitOps and those kinds of large scale operations that you need to do. The last mile for all of this is that hardware config. You know, the, the example we have with the, uh, the, the, the telco in Europe with that device, we had to do, we had to be very, very specific about what the hardware was and how it was going to be connected because otherwise being able to detect, detect that is still a pretty hard problem. We're working on it, but it's still a pretty hard problem, which is why standardized hardware, color-coded plugs, if you can't get this right, you know, there'll be a performance review. Um, but that's the last mile, being able to more cleverly identify what the hardware is and how that works, and then be able to take action in order to automate all of this installation and, and updating management is the next thing we have to do. So here are some projects you might want to look at that, that have been helping our customers with these things. MicroOS, Rancher, Uni, K3S, Fleet, Longhorn, so on and so forth. We can talk a lot more about these uh, at our booth if, if you'd like to. And if you'd like to know more, uh, at SUSECON, uh, which is our convention that we have, our user conference, um, there's a lot of information about edge computing and edge technologies. Some of these use cases are in there as well, exactly you know, how they worked and what the, what the huge uh, problems were. Um, it's, a, it's a digital conference, so you can just go in, you sign up. We, we promise not to spam you. You have to tick lots of boxes before we will spam you. So if you don't, if you don't tick the boxes, we won't spam you. Um, but there's lots of, of uh, presentations, uh, content, case studies, technical content, all of that kind of stuff. I really encourage you to go have a look. It's free. Costs you nothing to go to go check it out. Uh, Community.suze.com. That's our online community for discussion. Suze projects uh, at GitHub is the list of projects that Suze works on. Everything we do is open. It's all open source. It's all in the clear. So you can go have a look. And if you want to get started with some small edge devices yourself, like a Raspberry Pi or something like that, if you have a Raspberry Pi 4, go to SUSE at Home, the uh, project on GitHub, and we'll take you step by step how to install a lightweight operating system, how to install a lightweight Kubernetes, and then get some apps working that might be useful at home, uh, home automation and entertainment and things like that. Right, well with that, I've got 58 seconds left, so thank you very much. I will take all your questions so long as you can get them done in 40 seconds. Thank you, everybody. I'll talk to you again soon.